Hello, my name is Mandy Ultimus Stahl, and I am the archivist here at the Massillon Museum. I, the, as an archivist, I am in charge of historic photographs and documents, and I've been here for 16 years with a wonderful staff and a wonderful building that we just expanded, and I am so happy to be here with you today sharing one of my favorite topics, the Titanic. Now, uh, we are 108 years away from uh, the sinking of the Titanic in 1912, and we still talk about it, and it's still intriguing to us. And uh, obviously, you're out there watching. Um, I've delivered this lecture to more than 65 different groups over the last eight years. So clearly, I'm not alone in being intrigued by this topic. So uh, I would really love to share my thoughts, uh, some artifacts from the Maslow Museum's collection, and take you on a journey and share some of these stories. So why on earth is Titanic still a big deal today? Um, thinking about it, in 1912, it was the largest moving object. So um, it was, uh, you know, the most massive ship that had ever been built. Um, so you could travel across the Atlantic in this luxurious ship. So that in and of itself is very exciting. And a lot of people get very excited about the intricacies of uh, the engineering involved. Uh, the luxury aboard the ship, the uh, first class opulence of their staterooms and of um, all of the accommodations that they had are just so gorgeous and, uh, you know, kind of allows us to take a step back in time and enjoy maybe, uh, you know, pretending like we're on the ship in that moment. Uh, calling something unsinkable, obviously we know now is a bad idea, um, but to think of a, a ship that was practically unsinkable, that should never have sunk, uh, actually sinking and also, um, you know, taking down with it 1,523 uh, people uh, to their graves is uh, just kind of one of those mind-blowing moments. Like, how could this have possibly happened? Uh, and that's where I always ask that question, like, how did this even happen? How did all of these things go wrong to, to bring us to this point? Uh, the millionaires and celebrities aboard for the maiden voyage. Again, uh, thinking of these uh, great millionaires going to their graves, how could that have happened? Um, you know, just reading about the, the type of people who are rubbing shoulders together in this one contained moment in time that we can see from so many different angles. It's very, very intriguing. Captain Smith's last voyage before retirement. So Captain Smith was a veteran of the sea uh, for many, many decades. And this was supposed to be his last hurrah, a super easy trip across the Atlantic that he had made many, many times. And uh, unfortunately, obviously, it did not go as according to plan. Uh, the perfect storm of mistakes. We'll go over these in finer detail later, but there were so many things that had to go wrong in, you know, every aspect of uh, the ship, of the hitting of the iceberg, of the sinking itself, of communication. Uh, all of those things were just, you know, piled on top of each other, which made this then kind of impossible not to have happened. Romantic heroism. I think that... Um, I know for me, I love romantic movies and, and things like Downton Abbey, um, but to think back to this era as this beautiful, um, you know, kind of romantic time, uh, you know, people get very nostalgic about this era, um, you know, thinking about whether or not I could leave my husband on the ship um, when it really came down to it. Could I get into that lifeboat uh, knowing leaving him on the deck would mean that he would he would perish. So, um, you know, people who uh, heroically uh, lifted women and children into the boat, people who went back for survivors once they were in the water, um, all of those, those intriguing heroism moments um, definitely uh, intrigue us. Uh, and of course, the massive loss of life with all of the classes uh, perishing together. So it's not just, uh, you know, the millionaires that are dying or, um, you know, immigrants that are dying, it's everybody. So it didn't matter how rich you were if you were aboard the Titanic, your chances of dying were, were almost as good uh, as someone uh, in steerage class. So um, it, it was kind of a humbling moment that, that uh, the, the strata of first class to third class just kind of, uh, kind of flattened uh, together where everybody uh, was, was pretty much facing death at this point. So I want to explain the era that she came from, uh, just because um, we really have to understand why, why it was such a big deal at the time. So uh, Titanic was built during the Edwardian era, uh, which was uh, named for King Edward uh, of England. Uh, it's also then in France uh, referred to as La Belle Epoque. 
Uh, and here in America, it was called the Gilded Age. Um, for us, uh, it was gilded because it, um, it looked shiny and beautiful, like we were being extra prosperous here in America. Uh, but underneath that gilded layer uh, was a lot of rot uh, and bad things um, that we tried to then uh, correct over this time period. Um, the sinking uh, of the Titanic kind of represents the end of this era uh, because just two years later, we would find ourselves in World War I. Um, so after an epic, uh, you know, great war, when you look back nostalgically to the time of the Titanic, um, that, that definitely resonates with people. It's also definitely a paradigm shift uh, when men realize that we have not conquered the sea, not men, but mankind has realized um, that we are in fact not uh, completely in charge. We are not the, the biggest force here on earth, but the ocean and an iceberg can in fact still, uh, still bring you down and, and kill people. So uh, in America, uh, it was definitely an era of muckraking. So that would be uh, to clean up uh, corruption, clean up things that are wrong. Uh, a perfect example is uh, The Jungle by Upton Sinclair, which was published in 1906, uh, that talks about some really bad uh, practices in meat packing uh, in the early 1900s. Um, that, uh, you know, the workers were abused, underpaid, um, you know, not everything that went into everyone's sausage was what they thought it was, um, you know, to, to cost save, they put some other things in there. So um, th that is kind of the perfect example of muckraking um, and cleaning up uh, the things that were wrong. Uh, keeping in mind, too, um, as we uh, want our workers to uh, be better represented, get better wages, not be abused and locked into their workplaces, uh, a lot of labor unions were formed. And keeping in mind that the millionaires aboard Titanic, those at the, the upper crust, those are the folks who were, you know, kind of owning these businesses that were, were doing some not so great things. So, um, so again, aboard the ship, you've got the people who are doing the labor and you've got these kind of robber barons at the top who are making a profit uh, off of that labor uh, and um, some kind of willy-nilly practices in their industries. So women and children, um, Back in the early 1900s, uh, women were expected to, uh, they, they could go out into the workplace and work in places, um, you know, making shirts. Um, they were allowed to teach. Uh, but if they got married, they, they were really expected to, uh, to return to the home because they were the moral center. Uh, of course, once you get married, you were expected to then have children. And um, so you being a working woman, out in the world, I don't know, knowing things, uh, learning stuff, uh, and bringing that back home uh, was just, just not seen uh, as very proper. In uh, 1900, nearly 3 million children were working in uh, cotton mills, mining, and other jobs. At this time, there were, there were no real, we'll call them family planning uh, initiatives that um, people could uh, wait between to have children. So people were having children as they happen. So sometimes uh, families who uh, didn't have enough money to feed the mouths of all of these children uh, had to kind of, if you will, farm them out. Uh, those children had to go get jobs. Um, and they're not typically fun jobs. Um, you know, they had to pay well, um, but they were typically very dangerous, uh, which is unfortunate. Um, just to give you an example of how oppressive uh, some of these workplaces were, um, the Triangle Shirtwaist Company in New York City in 1911, um, they had uh, realized that women were taking a, a break outside on the emergency uh, stairwells uh, that were outside the building. And, uh, you know, when you're working for 8 to 12 hours a day, sewing together shirts, uh, you need a break. And uh, the, the people, uh, management up above, thought that they were really kind of wasting company time. Uh, so they decided to lock all of the emergency stairwells to keep them from taking a break outside. So, of course, uh, when you set up something like that, uh, the inevitable happens and a fire breaks out, but no one could get out of the building uh, because they had locked those stairwells, because they had locked them in place. There was no way to escape. Um, so more than 100 women lost their lives in this tragedy, and uh, it takes something like this, of course, for regulations to change uh, and to make safer workplaces, but what a way to get to, to better regulations.
Um, Lewis Hine was a photographer, um, most famously of uh, photographing the Empire State Building being built. And he also photographed a, a magnificent uh, series on child labor. And as I said before, these were not easy jobs. Um, so if you'll see there on the left, uh, we have a young coal miner. Um, I believe he was something like 14 and uh, he was already, uh, you know, consuming alcohol, smoking, uh, you know, gambling, uh, doing all the things that you wouldn't want children to be doing. But um, his life as a coal miner was, was very difficult. So that's how he responded. We also have then on the right side, uh, children uh, in a mill in Macon, Georgia. And um, obviously for the uh, folks in charge, it was great because they had little nimble fingers that could get into the pieces and parts to help fix it or move it or, or what have you. Uh, but unfortunately, if you'll see, they're not tall enough to actually reach the floor. Um, so now you have uh, you know hands and feet next to big moving uh, machinery parts, and that's not a good combination. So um, many, many injuries came out of this uh, era as well. So uh, child labor uh, laws were, were definitely changed uh, after this. So the good news is uh, that out of uh, this era and all of the bad things that happen, the quality of life does increase and they do actually make a difference in uh, the lives of people around the world. Uh, so there were safer working conditions. Uh, there was a greater focus on health and wellness. Things like vitamins are good, exercise is great. Um, you see a lot of YMCAs opening up uh, at this time in the 1910s. Uh, there was no retirement program. So um, keeping in mind that no one could just retire at the age of 55 or 60, um, you, you couldn't do that. Uh, it wasn't until the 1930s that Social Security uh, uh, became available uh, as part of the Great Depression efforts of uh, President Roosevelt. The uh, installation of electric lights in this era that was still a relatively new technology, um, but that made it safer for people to engage in nighttime activities. You could stroll down the streets, um, you could attend uh, you know, various functions and theaters, uh, events, and not feel uh, quite as uh, unsafe uh, because it was actually bright downtown. Your life expectancy in 1900 was 49 for women and 47 for men. And you can see a huge jump here in the 20 years uh, that followed. Again, kind of fixing all of those things and focusing on health and wellness. Uh, we rise to 56 for women and 54 for men. So that's a big jump in life expectancy in just a small period of time. Uh, work uh, week averages, uh, 1890. Uh, your average work week was 60 hours. Um, and that was, I can't imagine um, doing that all the time, and especially in those very, very uh, labor-intensive occupations. Uh, in 1920, it was 51 hours, uh, so a massive drop in the number of hours that you typically worked, so uh, that left time for more leisure activities. In 1895, there were four automobiles out on the road, and by 1917, there were nearly four million. Um, so uh, you, you can see that this era was definitely the, the boom of the automobile, the horseless carriage. Um, here in Maslin, uh, at the Maslin Museum, we do have a dual automobile uh, on display. Uh, so when it's safe to do so again, please come back and see us. Um, in uh, 1908, uh, Ford introduced um, the Model T for just $850. Uh, because of his assembly line process, he was able to make them quicker and cheaper uh, for kind of the everyday uh, person. So now it wasn't just for those uh, who were very wealthy, uh, it was kind of for everybody. Now on this side, uh, if you'll see, this is a reproduction of the car that was owned by William Carter. Uh, Carter was aboard the Titanic and he brought his car with him. Now, um, if you've seen James Cameron's Titanic, you may uh, remember a certain scene that takes place in a car. And uh, unfortunately, historians have kind of come to the conclusion that this would have been crated in pieces. So it wouldn't have just been a, a car sitting in the hold uh, quite like portrayed there, but um, still a lovely romantic scene uh, in the cargo hold uh, of the ship. Uh, so in order to get people across uh, the country, the uh, Lincoln Highway was begun in 1912 and was finished by 1913. So this is the very first transcontinental road where you could actually uh, drive from one coast to the other. So uh, improvements of roads uh, were really starting because up until this point, they were just kind of muddy and rutted with wagon wheel tracks and um, they were definitely improved uh, during this time. 
So how do we entertain ourselves during this era? Um, there were quite a lot of things, and uh, you know, keeping in mind, especially for younger viewers, um, there were no video games per se. There were no uh, Netflix accounts to be had. There was no internet, um, which I always feel you know, now having had all of those things, how did people entertain themselves? And you find those things when the power goes out um, at home. Um, but there were, there were great things to, to go and do. Um, you could go to uh, resorts. Uh, there were expositions uh, quite often uh, once a year uh, throughout the country and throughout the world. Um, so you could have these different pavilions where you could kind of travel around to different cultures. Uh, a lot of uh, Entertainment places like Cedar Point uh, became popular during this time, although Cedar Point was actually more known for its promenade uh, walkway on the beach than its roller coasters. Uh, they did have a few wooden roller coasters, but uh, that was not the focus of going to Cedar Point at the time. Uh, exercising at the YMCA, uh, you could go to football games or you could participate in football games. Um, here in Massillon, we obviously had quite a lot of options. There were many, many uh, semi-pro teams and the high school teams uh, playing here, the Massillon Tigers, uh, the Massillon Maroons, the Massillon Blues. There were many, many groups uh, out there sporting it up. Uh, another thing that you could do is uh, attend a uh, silent film uh, showing. There were many, many theaters. Uh, by 1910, there were 10,000 uh, movie theaters across, uh, across the country, so there were so many ways for you to go and see moving pictures, which were still kind of a novelty. Um, they were still very, very short, um, real big, long narrative uh, silent films weren't, uh, weren't big until the 1920s when they really did have a, a big you know, hour, uh, hour long story or longer. And sheet music and recorded music uh, was played in homes. Uh, that's how people uh, listened to music. You could uh, listen to a vinyl record on your Victrola. You could listen to an Edison wax cylinder on your player. Um, but a lot of people were musically inclined, had a piano, and uh, the family could get together and uh, sing together uh, somewhere during the day. Um, these photos are all from the collection of the museum. So uh, down here on the bottom, this is an unidentified group of folks uh, in their lovely 1910s uh, swimsuits. Uh, you'll notice how very covering they are. The bikini did not come in until much, much later. Um, down here we have uh, a group, uh, a musical group. I'm, they are unidentified uh, as well, but uh, they've got their sheet music out there and they are going to uh, entertain someone. So that's pretty great. Uh, and up top there, that is the uh, Agathon ball field where both uh, semi-pro baseball team, the Agathons played, uh, as well as several uh, football teams as well. So out of this era comes the largest moving object ever created. So uh, if you think back to uh, immigration when uh, many of our families uh, came during the 1840s or late 1800s. Um, immigration uh, was on very slow sailing ships, so it could have taken up to a month for you to actually get from Europe to America. Uh, but advancements in shipping by 1912 uh, allowed ships to travel much faster with uh, approximately a week uh, travel time. So um, as we, we move forward in, in shipping, um, you know, not only can you go faster, uh, but you want to have kind of a more luxurious ride. So it's not quite like the sailing ships that really kind of go up and down in the waves. Now you've got this huge ship uh, that can like nicely go and you don't really notice the waves as much. So you can have these luxurious uh, cabins aboard for your millionaires. Um, so uh, Bruce Ismay and uh, William Peary in 1907 got together and decided that they were going to make three uh, Olympic class ships. Uh, there were going to be the Olympic in 1909, Titanic in 1912, and the Britannic in 1914. Um, so unfortunately, uh, only one of those ships really made it through the whole course of its lifetime, uh, the, the uh, Olympic. Uh, it was launched first in 1909 and was basically the same twin ship to Titanic. There were some, obviously, uh, there were some differences, but uh, it was 
basically the same um, and it was first. Uh, so many of the photographs that you see uh, are actually of the Olympic and not the Titanic because the first ship gets all the pictures taken of it. Um, no one knew that the Titanic would be so um, so intriguing uh, that many years later they didn't know it was going to sink so they didn't take as many photographs aboard Titanic uh, as the Olympic. Uh, the Britannic unfortunately um, uh, finds itself in the Mediterranean during World War I. It's serving as a hospital ship uh, and it strikes a mine and uh, sinks very, very quickly um, in the Mediterranean. So uh, only the Olympic makes its way through uh, to be scrapped, uh, I believe, in the 1930s, um, but it had served many, many decades. So here we have Titanic being built um, at a cost of about $7.5 million uh, in the day, or about $400 million uh, in today's money. So how do we build a ship this large? So uh, she was designed by Thomas Andrews uh, at Harland and Wolf. Uh, she was owned by the White Star Line, so they would have commissioned Harland and Wolf to build it. Uh, there were 2,000 plates at one inch thick that were held together by 3 million rivets. Now, each of these rivets had to be heated up, thrown up to a person who was putting them in. They would catch it with a bucket uh, and then put it into, uh, into the hole and pound it in there before it cools. So a very quick, fast, dangerous process. So uh, there were no pneumatic devices to help them. So if you'll see here uh, on the right side, uh, those are some of the gentlemen actually putting in those rivets by hand. Um, three million rivets, so time consuming. Um, there were 3,000 workers that took two years to actually build the Titanic, so you can see why, uh, with uh, the tools available to them. So the result uh, was a 46,000 ton uh, ship with three ginormous propellers uh, that were 98 tons each, and uh, she has four funnels. Now, what I always love to point out, this is my sinking Titanic bath toy, um, is that when you look at the Titanic, uh, you think it looks kind of grand, right? So uh, technology adva had advanced to this point uh, where with the boiler rooms the way that they were, you only needed uh, three uh, funnels. And the fourth one, is actually a dummy funnel. So it's basically a ventilation shaft. It doesn't really serve any purpose except to make Titanic look, ah, super grand. Um, so I have seen some Titanic movies uh, and renditions and renderings and paintings and things that show billowing black smoke coming out of the fourth funnel. So if you see that happen, just ignore whatever they have to say because that is not accurate. This is just a dummy funnel to, to make it look pretty. So there you have it. So she's 882 feet long, 175 feet high. Um, because of this massive, massive ship, uh, she actually takes uh, 650 tons of coal per day to travel, and that uh, equates to two pounds of coal for every, uh, every foot. I'm sorry, one pound of coal for every two feet that she travels. So every two feet is another pound of coal. Um, so you can imagine crossing the Atlantic is many, many, many feet. And uh, it, Titanic took, obviously, quite a lot of coal uh, to, <laughs> to make it happen. So unfortunately, during the time that Titanic is launched, there's been a lot of publicity uh, put into all of this. Um, and you can't just not have the Titanic set sail on her maiden voyage, um, but there was a coal strike. Uh, again, these workers trying to get better conditions for themselves, better working hours, et cetera. And uh, there was a sh coal shortage as a result of this strike. So uh, unfortunately for uh, many of the ships surrounding Titanic, she buys up all the, the coal from those ships and basically leaves them stranded. Uh, so whoever had booked tickets on those other ships now have the option to board the Titanic. Um, so many people who were aboard Titanic that night weren't even supposed to be there. They had booked passage on a completely different ship, uh, but as fate would have it, they found themselves aboard the ill-fated Titanic. So there are those uh, three uh, massive uh, triple screw propellers, 98 tons each. Uh, this is in the dry dock at Belfast. And this is just part of one of the funnels. Um, it's like the, it's like the tippity top, black topper portion uh, of of our ship. So if you consider that it's just this little guy right here, um, that's a pretty pretty massive part. 
And so for comparison's sake, um, just to give you an idea, if you've ever seen the Queen Mary, um, or if you've seen the, the Airbus, uh, the massive, massive plane, this is the proportions that we're looking at uh, for Titanic. Um, and then a lot of people ask what, uh, how, how Titanic compares to cruise ships today. Cruise ships today are insane. They're huge. Um, so <laughs> they are many, many, many decks uh, more than the Titanic was. Um, they're, they're much wider. Um, and much longer in most cases. So you can see, uh, see there, she's many, many proportions more uh, than the Titanic was. But again, at the time, Titanic was the largest moving object. So here are the uh, workers leaving the shipyard for the day. So uh, back in the back here, you can see uh, Titanic there being built um, and all of these people leaving for the day. Again, 3,000 workers making the ship happen. Okay, so now we're nearing the end of, of building Titanic. So who on earth would have ever said that this ship was unsinkable? Um, so reportedly at the launch of Titanic, uh, which is where they send the ship out to make sure that everything's sealed up, all the rivets are where they're supposed to be, make sure that she's seaworthy. Um, supposedly one of the White Star Line uh, employees said not even God himself could sink this ship. Now that clearly in hindsight is a very, very stupid statement but there were many reasons why we would think that she was practically unsinkable. So uh, when the Olympic had hit uh, another ship, the SS Hawk, uh, just before Titanic's launch, uh, basically they realized that, wow, this hull is not very great. Um, so what if you know, we were to hit something else um, you know, more massive or with more force? So uh, they actually gave her a, a bottom, uh, double-bottomed hull. Uh, to kind of keep it safe. So if she ran aground or if she ran over an iceberg, um, it would theoretically uh, stop that from sinking the ship. The other thing that she had were uh, watertight bulkheads. So watertight bulkheads were a great theory. Um, so these black lines here uh, represent each one of uh, those watertight bulkheads. So in theory, if you scraped along and you hit about four of these compartments, you'd still be good to go because they would be sealed off. Uh, that water would be just fine, and uh, it would not bring you down. The problem is, is that Titanic, because she uh, put her side towards the iceberg and scraped along for a while, she opened up about six uh, of those compartments. So as a result, as you see here, all of this water, as it starts to go up, it starts to bring the ship down because it's too heavy. So uh, the other unfortunate part is that uh, where those bulkheads actually stop, right there. Uh, so if the water gets up to that point, it's just going to spill over and continue uh, spilling over all the way back, 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 and back, and continue to pull the ship down with the weight of all of that water. So uh, it was a great theory, but of course we found the kind of one scenario in which this watertight bulkhead thing didn't quite work. Now, if the bulkheads had gone all the way up through the ship, it would have been different. But you would have also have had to have put these watertight bulkheads that are very bulky with big iron doors, like smack in the middle of promenade decks uh, in first class. And you know that was not going to go over very well with our millionaires uh, who were paying massive quantities of money to be aboard. So they stopped them, stopped those watertight bulkheads at E deck. So again, some of these things uh, contributing to uh, what will eventually happen on April 14th. So the lifeboat situation, why on earth did she not have enough lifeboats? Well, uh, at the time, the Board of Trade had uh, uh, a law that said that ships over uh, 10,000 tons, they had to carry 16 lifeboats. So Titanic carried 20. So Titanic actually had more lifeboats than were required by law. But obviously, the Board of Trade uh, laws had not quite caught up to uh, reality just yet. So any ship over 10,000 tons, Titanic was 46,000 tons. So four times uh, that size uh, is what would have been required. So um, they were supposed to be originally, I believe, 56 lifeboats. Um, but again, it was kind of taking up the promenade deck space uh, up on top. And of course, lifeboats on an unsinkable ship. Why are you taking up room on our beautiful promenade deck that we're trying to show off? So they cut that down to uh, to 20. 
Um, so that was 16 actual big, hard wooden lifeboats and then four uh, smaller collapsible boats uh, that were made of canvas uh, that were actually stored above the officer's quarters. So you'd have to like pull them down and then attach them to the davits in order for them to work. So complicated, very complicated. So um, with the actual lifeboats that she had on board, she had space for 1,100 people. And uh, the night the Titanic sank, there were 2,208. So almost exactly half uh, of the passengers could get off the ship if, and only if, you actually loaded those boats to capacity. The problem is, is that uh, people didn't believe she was sinking. Uh, people were scared to load these lifeboats. Uh, with, you know, 65 or more people in each one of these, like what if the boat, as we're swinging out over the ocean, breaks in half or falls? Um, so they, they did not load them to capacity. So with a total of 1,100 people that could have been saved, uh, only 705 uh, actually do survive. So in Titanic's cargo hold, uh, there were some interesting things. We've already talked about the uh, Renault car that was owned by William Carter. Uh, there were 3,364 uh, bags of mail. That is why she is the RMS Titanic, the Royal Mail Steamer. So not only could you get your passengers across the Atlantic in a week, you could also get your mail across the, the Atlantic very quickly in a week. So there was a cask of China headed for Tiffany's, 30 cases of golf clubs and tennis rackets for A.G. Spalding. There was a jeweled uh, copy of the Rubaiyat by Omar Khayyam. Uh, it was a beautiful piece that was just recently purchased at auction. Uh, the binding took two years to put together. There were more than 1,500 precious stones, each individually set in gold. Uh, unfortunately, that has not been retrieved, and uh, the way that the uh, rec site works, that anything that's paper or wood or soft you know, bone, uh, that all goes away. So somewhere down on the ocean floor, 1,500 beautiful precious stones that, uh, that have fallen out of this beautiful copy of the book. And there were four cases of opium, uh, which uh, at the time was used to treat headaches. So, interesting. Of course, you have to feed all of these people. So 2,208 people, three meals a day for a week. Uh, there were 75,000 pounds of fresh meat. Uh, there were uh, 40,000 fresh eggs, 40 tons of potatoes. They were served basically in all three classes for many of the meals. So 40 tons of potatoes. Uh, there were 20,000 bottles of beer and stout, so you know that people were having a really good time. Uh, and of course, just 1,000 oyster forks because you wouldn't need to serve those in any other class than first. Uh, and here is a menu from aboard the Titanic. Uh, this would have been uh, from the uh, night that she sank. And also, I have to give a shout out to those uh, who were aboard Titanic and in the panic thought to do things like save the menu and uh, bring it with them. So they were definitely like archivists at heart trying to save these things. So how do you get your millionaires to uh, buy into this idea uh, of, of being on your ship, which is a little bit slower than the other ships, um, but oh, look at how much more luxurious it is. Um, so you have to give them beautiful options. So uh, we had the use of the pool for 25 cents. Uh, the squash court, you could go and play for 50 cents, which included the use of an instructor. The gymnasium, which featured such wonderful things as the electric camel, in case you needed to practice riding a camel as you're crossing the Atlantic. Uh, the Turkish baths, uh, be beautiful sauna, basically in the Turkish style. Um, one of the things that was never photographed aboard Titanic, uh, but was recently discovered in the wreck. Dining, uh, there were four options, the Cafe Parisien, the a la carte restaurant, the Palm Court, uh, and then the formal dining room. So you had many options of places to eat. Uh, and in that menu, uh, it was a 10 course meal that was served uh, the night that Titanic sank. All right, so these Turkish baths, this is a, a rendering from the time that I believe was in a magazine, probably more likely to uh, entertain, uh, uh, to get people excited to purchase tickets. Um, so this is what it, it would have looked like. It's got some like Middle Eastern elements in it, uh, which are, are pretty gorgeous. Uh, and this is what it looks like today. Again, having never seen, uh, you know, photographs of it. This is really the first photograph, uh, thanks to James Cameron, who continues to go down to the wreck uh, more than any other person on the earth. 
Um, so it, they were very, very shocked to see that the tiles were still in place. They were still beautiful and brilliantly colored. So that is the Turkish baths today. And there is the gymnasium aboard the Olympic. Um, uh, you know, various uh, things to, to exercise, kind of some rowing machines and punching bags, um, lots of, of good options to keep you fit. Um, so then again, here's a rendering, and uh, here's that lovely electric camel. I think these might both be uh, electric camels. So, um, you know, for all those times that you need to ride a camel, here's, here's your moment to pretend and practice. Uh, the smoking room, obviously you can see how opulent this is. We've got electric lights, that's so great. Um, there's stained glass that was absolutely gorgeous. Um, again, trying to entertain those millionaires and make them, um, you know, make them as comfortable and feel uh, as opulent as possible. Okay, now this is my piece of trivia, and I know that I won't be able to hear you, but please feel free to say out loud, what ship does this grand staircase exist on? What is this a photograph of? And of course, your first response is going to be Titanic, of course, but it isn't. Uh, again, so Olympic came first, and they photographed every inch of it, and then along came Titanic, and they were like, meh, we've seen it before, it's kind of the same. So there is no photograph of Titanic's Grand Staircase, <laughs> right? It's crazy. Um, so the, the Grand Staircase that we've all, you know, fallen in love with and used as a photograph is actually aboard the Olympic. Now, that's not to say that they didn't look exactly the same, um, but the photograph uh, of, of the Grand Staircase is of the Olympic Grand Staircase. So there's, there's some, some tidbits for you. So you can use that as your, your fun trivia and the fourth funnel being a dummy funnel if you need to stump your friends. So give it a try. Uh, here we are with the dining rooms. I mean, such an expansive, massive, beautiful space. Um, I love when people colorize and also uh, recreate these spaces. Um, I'm actually very excited. Uh, Titanic Honor and Glory, uh, they are coming out with a full video game, and they are recreating every single space within the Titanic. So if you wanted to go into a cupboard in the maid's quarters, like you could go to there, and it will be as accurate as humanly possible. Um, so I will put a link below. There will be many links to many cool resources down below after this video. But I mean, to be able to like walk through these spaces in 3D um, is just, um, I don't know, as a, as a Titanic nerd, I'm super excited. So we jumped down to the third class accommodations. That's actually not too shabby. Um, when you think about the conditions that a lot of the immigrants who were uh, riding in third class, they came from, um, you know, crowded conditions of coal mining towns, um, you know, how many people can you fit into a home, so many different generations living together, um, you know, this is actually pretty opulent um, for, for those folks to, uh, to ride across the ocean in. Now, that being said, they still slept typically 10 to a room, um, so the conditions were not exactly spacious and... Uh, perfect, but, um, you know, it was still a, a step up. So here's an example of a uh, third class family. These are the Goodwins. Um, they, uh, they were traveling in third class. Uh, they had actually booked aboard another steamship, uh, but because of the coal strike found themselves aboard Titanic. Um, so, uh, the, before this picture was taken, or after this picture was taken, uh, baby Sydney uh, Goodwin was born, so his photo is there on the right-hand side. Um, baby Sydney is important um, because he was, um, he was found in the, in the wreckage, um, and his body uh, was buried in Halifax, Nova Scotia, but he remained unidentified um, because he didn't have any ID on him. There was no one nearby that was identified to, you know, kind of inform who he was. Um, so forever and ever, there are these um, beautiful baby shoes in the, um, in the uh, collection of the, uh, the Titanic Museum, and um, they really wanted to know who, who this baby was. Give him a name. Give him his, his identity back. Um, so through DNA testing uh, in the 2010s, um, they actually finally were able to track down that this was, in fact, Sidney Goodwin. Um, so his gravesite right there, um, they were finally able to add his name uh, down there at the bottom. So he was just two years old, um, but he finally has a name. So how much would it have cost uh, to actually purchase a ticket uh, aboard the Titanic? So 
Uh, in third class, it was about $45. They actually adapted it to where you came from. So if you had a lot of travel costs to get to Southampton where Titanic was leaving from, uh, your ticket would be less. Um, so that translates to about $1,200 today, um, which doesn't maybe sound like a whole lot, but when you consider something like the Goodwin family, you've got you, you've got your spouse, you've got how many children, well now we're talking about, you know, $9,000, $10,000 that you're trying to get together for everyone to go uh, across uh, the ocean. So <coughs> typically when people were traveling in third class, it's because it <coughs> they were trying to um, start a new life. Um, they're not going to be making this trip back and forth like the millionaires are. They're just literally, you know, it's a one-time cost to go start a new life in America. Um, just to uh, tell you how high hygiene ranks on the list of important things, um, there were two bathtubs for all 700 um, passengers in third class. Um, so not a lot of bathing was happening in the third class. So the first class tickets, um, it was about $4,500 uh, translated to today. That's about $100,000. So, um, you know, for millionaires or today billionaires, that wouldn't be, you know, terribly expensive. And again, you want all of those great accommodations um, with the squash court and the promenade decks and all these beautiful uh, accommodations uh, as you're traveling across the Atlantic. So uh, most of them have their own private uh, bedrooms, bathrooms, um, and again, those promenade decks that you could pay extra for. Titanic uh, leaves Southampton, England uh, on April 10th, 1912. Uh, she comes across the uh, English Channel uh, over to Cherbourg, France. She makes her way up to Queenstown, Ireland on April 11th, and then she begins heading uh, towards New York. Uh, her estimated date of arrival was April 17th, 1912, uh, and obviously we know she never made it there. On her maiden voyage, uh, it's uh, Sunday, April 14th. Church services have uh, happened in the morning, several different uh, denominations uh, hold services, and uh, there was a lifeboat uh, drill scheduled for that Sunday, uh, but Captain Smith, looking at the beautiful day, thought it would be uh, such a shame uh, to, to hold a lifeboat drill uh, in the middle uh, of all of that enjoyment of the weather. So he cancels it. Um, they would have had to have stopped the ship. They would have had to have lowered the lifeboats. They would have had to have sent them off and then gathered them all back up. It would have been a very cumbersome process that really would have ruined the day. Now, the problem is, is that most passengers weren't really sure where to go. Um, the crew had had a lifeboat uh, drill uh, before they left port. Um, so they kind of knew what they were doing. But again, you know, refreshers and, and being able to tell passengers where to go in case of emergency would have been very, very helpful um, at this time. So uh, throughout the day, uh, they received at least six major ice warnings, um, warning them of ice fields, icebergs, um, cold temperatures, um, but they, they weren't heated because they didn't see anything that um, was really in their way just yet. Um, the top speed of Titanic uh, is estimated at about 29 miles per hour, which doesn't sound very fast, but when you think about hitting something at 29 miles an hour, uh, that can be devastating. So one of the other uh, scientific uh, achievements uh, that was aboard Titanic was the wireless telegraph. Um, so there was a telegraph office aboard Titanic, and for the most part, they were there for the Marconi company. And uh, that meant sending passen passenger traffic uh, back and forth. So if Mrs. Astor wanted to let her stepson Vincent know to bring a wrap to the uh, train station, uh, those were the kinds of messages that they were sending back and forth. Um, it was lovely that they were all passing along these ice warnings and uh, other congratulatory notes, um, but they weren't necessarily like required to be there for those kinds of things. Um, so our two, uh, our two gentlemen uh, here, uh, Jack Phillips and Harold Bride. Uh, Jack Phillips, unfortunately, uh, does not make it. Harold Bride does. They both um, uh, eventually would spend the night uh, on an overturned lifeboat. Uh, Harold Bride's feet uh, were in the water the whole time, the whole night, um, and he suffered from uh, some pretty severe pr uh, frostbite. Um, Jack Phillips, uh, unfortunately, does not make it through the night. 
So uh, unfortunately, the, the spring of 1912 is unreasonably warm. Um, and there were, uh, you know, there's newer theories with, uh, there was a super moon uh, in January of 1912 that could have, uh, you know, pulled a tide, pulled an iceberg early, um, kind of changed some of the currents. Um, there's a lot of little factors at play here. Um, but uh, Captain Smith really didn't think that this was going to be a big deal uh, going through, you know, this zone of, you know, kind of Iceberg Alley uh, because icebergs weren't typically seen in this part uh, in April. And so he's kind of got his many, many decades at sea working against him, uh, not knowing that, um, you know, this is kind of a special, special situation uh, that, that is happening. So nobody really quite knows what the iceberg looked like. Um, there were some people on deck that saw it uh, when it hit the ship, um, but there was no moon uh, to shine and help them see it. There was no wind to help see the base of it. Um, so it would have been a very dark piece of ice in the middle of a dark ocean. Um, so even if you were seeing it go by, could you really draw it from memory? So some survivors have, but they're such different shapes. No one really... Um, you know, can say for sure. The reason I put this photograph up here is that uh, shortly after Titanic sank, uh, the cook aboard the uh, Prince Adelbert ship saw that uh, this iceberg had red paint uh, at the bottom of the base of the iceberg. And of course, Titanic, her bottom was red. So in theory, this may or may not have been uh, the iceberg that sank the Titanic. So the key here when we talk about the iceberg is not necessarily what is above the water because uh, you've only got you know a couple eighths uh, and then like seven eighths below uh, the water is, is where you got to watch, uh, especially in that zone where it juts under the water. So if you're visually looking at it, it looks like Titanic missed the iceberg, but under the water, uh, she, she got punctured. So the timeline of the sinking. So this is a little bit more newer uh, research as well. The Smithsonian Magazine from 2012, you should definitely look it up, um, is that uh, where Titanic wa was, was traveling to suddenly hit into the Labrador uh, corridor current. Um, so suddenly it was warm air, uh, and then it got really, really freezing and cold, and that's where these icebergs were coming down uh, where they shouldn't necessarily have been. Um, a lot of passengers talk about it getting really cold um, all of a sudden and uh, dropping below freezing. And uh, at 11.30 uh, p.m., uh, Jack Phillips, uh, who works the wireless telegraph, uh, unfortunately the telegraph had been down uh, for most of the day and he and Harold Bride had finally fixed it uh, back up. But as they were approaching shore, many more passengers wanted to send notes and uh, telegraphs to their loved ones. So the pile of messages that they had to send to Cape Race uh, on the North American continent, uh, they were starting to pile up. So he was frazzled. He hadn't really slept in more than 24 hours. Um, he was exhausted and kind of cranky. And um, the way that wireless works is in those headphones, uh, the closer you are to a source, the louder it is. So somewhere nearby is a ship, the Californian, uh, that came over the wireless and uh, told Titanic uh, that uh, we are surrounded by ice. Uh, we've stopped for the night. Um, you know, you're traveling into this huge ice field. You might want to be careful. Uh, so Jack Phillips, again, being frazzled, being tired, he's already seen six major ice warnings today, tells him to shut up. So poor Cyril Evans aboard the Californian. Uh, also, uh, you know, he's the only wireless operator aboard his ship, and uh, he's not required to be on a 24-hour watch. He can go to sleep whenever he wants. Um, so here we are, 11.30 p.m., and... Uh, Poor Cyril Evans has been told to shut up, so he says, okie dokie. He takes off his headset and he goes to sleep. So this is 10 minutes before Titanic hits the iceberg. So if uh, Cyril Evans had not been asleep at the time, uh, you know, just 10 or so minutes later, uh, he might have heard the SOS and the CQD from Titanic just a few miles away. So again, another kind of newer theory uh, is that because of the, the super cold uh, water that kind of came out of nowhere, Labrador current kind of mixing in uh, with the, the warmer air, uh, is that uh, the, the horizon uh, became false. And you think that you're looking at something that is not like, you know, here's where you're thinking. 
um, you know, the horizon is, um, but uh, it's really just kind of like a foggy layer here and you miss altogether the iceberg. Um, so this kind of funky mirage layer that's, that's messing with what people can actually see on the horizon. So there is no moon that night to illuminate the, uh, the iceberg. There is no wind to make breaking water at the base of the iceberg to see it better. And um, the poor lookouts that are up 90 feet in the air in the crow's nest have no binoculars. So there was a last minute staffing change in Southampton and the guy who had the key to the binocular cabinet put it in his pocket and then he had left the ship. Not on purpose, but he left the ship. They couldn't get into the cabinet with the, the binoculars, so they're just using their naked eye on a very, very dark night with no moon and no wind. Um, so you can see the recipe for disaster that is forming. We have so many things that are going wrong so far. Here we are, accelerating into an ice field that we know is coming. So at 11.40 p.m., uh, Lookout Fleet phones the bridge uh, to say iceberg right ahead. Uh, First Officer Murdoch, um, who uh, this is, he's kind of newer to this class of ship, doesn't quite know how, um, you know, how much force is, is traveling with the Titanic. Um, and uh, he orders the engines full astern, uh, which means to go into reverse. Um, but unfortunately, the Titanic, again, has been moving forward at, you know, 30 miles an hour with so much weight behind her, um, you know, to slow down and, and go you know, in reverse is going to take a really, really, really long time. Um, so as, uh, as they're slowing down and trying to reverse, they slowly uh, inch up to the iceberg. Um, many say that if she had just kept going full speed, she could have turned faster away from the iceberg. Um, but uh, instead, because we're going too slow and we're trying to reverse, uh, the turning radius isn't quite what it needs to be. So Titanic scrapes past the iceberg, uh, puncturing those six uh, watertight compartments. And uh, whatever they do from that point forward, basically Titanic uh, is going to sink. One of the other technological advancements, uh, again, uh, water pumps, uh, in addition to being able to close those watertight compartments to keep the water in those compartments and then hopefully pump out the water. Uh, but unfortunately, um, the, the water itself is coming in at seven tons per second. So it is way too fast. Um, it is really going to pull down the ship very quickly. So at 11.45, Captain Smith comes up to the bridge uh, and immediately uh, sends people to start checking out the ship, see where water came in or if it didn't, see if everything's okay. Um, you know, some passengers report a, a slight jolt. Uh, some people who were closer to where the iceberg actually hit, um, typically in third class, say it, w it knocked them out of bed. Um, so varying levels of, uh, you know, passengers being aware of this uh, of this event. Um, so here on the left is uh, Thomas Andrews. So he is the one who designed uh, the ship and he is aboard the Titanic as he is with all of his ships the first time through to see what he can improve. Um, you know, see if the hot water is working on this floor. Um, you know, what else can he, he fix up? So um, he's there, he pulls out his blueprints to check out and see, um, you know, where water, you know, mark off where the water has been. And he calculates uh, that the Titanic has about 90 minutes until uh, she is completely underwater. Luckily, she has a little bit longer than that, um, but that's a, a pretty quick turnaround time. Um, to get everyone off the ship. And by everyone, of course, I mean half of the people off the ship. So uh, the captain uh, realizes that uh, we have to send out a distress signal. So there was a CQD and an SOS sent out by our wireless operators uh, to anyone in the area at midnight. Uh, the lifeboats are uncovered and all of the passengers are told to come up to the boat deck. Uh, of course, people in first class uh, being closest to the boats probably would have been there first and um, they really can't see why they're being told to get into the lifeboats because the ship is still flat, um, it's cold outside. Would you really want to get into this rickety wooden boat and go out into the North Atlantic in the dark for the next few hours and then get picked up by breakfast because it was all just a test? Um, you know, people were not very happy. They were not very keen to get into the boats. So the problem with the lifeboats uh, is that they were not actually launched until a full hour 
after uh, Titanic hits the iceberg. So because of the time it took to awaken the passengers, get them up, uncover the boats and swing them out and make sure that all of the davits and things were working, uh, you know, it, a full hour had passed. Um, the Titanic does have two hours and 40 minutes uh, until she sinks. But again, now you've wasted an hour. You have an hour and 40 minutes until she's completely gone. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the scramble is going to be massive as all of these people try to get aboard the lifeboats. And again, the, the millionaire ladies who are, are up on deck uh, are not keen on uh, getting into a lifeboat that seems incredibly rickety to go out into the North Atlantic to hang out in the lifeboat when they really don't think um, that the ship is sinking. Uh, that, but that was when the deck was nice and perfectly straight. Um, but of course, again, as that water pulls the Titanic down and the deck starts to tilt, well, now everybody kind of figures out that something's wrong. Um, so that's when people start to run up to the boat deck and, um, you know, fight for uh, their place aboard that. Um, so they were uh, sending out distress rockets. Um, again, the Californian uh, that was nearby, their wireless operator, having warned them about this ice field, he does not have his headphones on uh, to hear the wireless call. Um, the officers on the deck of the Californian are pretty much unable to see uh, you know, the rockets. Uh, they claim that they thought there was just like a tiny short freighter that was on the horizon and they didn't go to investigate, um, which they should have. Uh, but if you remember this slide back here, again, this weird funky false horizon uh, really kind of made Titanic look shorter than she, than she was. So, um, you know, whether or not they went to investigate, they didn't. Um, they could have saved uh, most of the rest of the lives of the people on board. So when loading the lifeboats, uh, obviously women and children first was the, the big call. And uh, this was not an official White Star Line rule. It was kind of a chivalrous idea of the sea. Uh, and of course, Captain Smith, uh, having spent many years on the sea, thought that this was a good idea, especially knowing that there were only lifeboats for half of the people on board. So, uh, they uh, begin uh, loading the lifeboats. You have on one side of the, the ship, uh, Second Officer Lightoller is, is loading boats, and he takes this as women and children only. Um, so he actually removed a 14-year-old boy from a lifeboat because he believed him to be a man. Now, it's supposed to be women and children first, and then if there's room, whoever else wants to get into the boat, please get into the boat. Um, so two different schools of thought there. Um, so on the other side uh, of the ship, First Officer Murdoch was in charge of loading boats, and he did let men on to uh, his lifeboats on his side of the ship. So some of the people who got off the ship that uh, made it a very controversial uh, sort of moment, uh, we have William Carter, uh, who owned the car. He and his wife uh, find themselves on Officer Murdoch's side, and they do get off the, the boat. Um, Carter's wife uh, later sues him for d divorce in 1914 and actually cites that he was saved from the Titanic, even though she was like with him at the time. She cites that as um, one of the reasons that she just can't be married to him anymore, which is kind of interesting. Um, so the biggest and most controversial uh, moment uh, is J. Bruce Ismay. So Ismay was one of the, the men who dreamed up these three uh, Olympic class ships. Um, he's aboard the Titanic. Um, of course, there's controversy as to whether or not he was telling the captain to speed up and beat records and get to New York faster than they think they're going to and surprise the presses and make it this big, um, you know, PR moment. Um, you know, there's no really good proof either way as to whether or not he did. Um, but here he is. Um, he's been helping people to get into the lifeboats um, and he's on collapsible sea. So that's like towards the very, very end. Uh, you know, whatever's left, these collapsible canvas boats that we've pulled off of the officers' quarters to uh, send passengers uh, through. The problem is, is that in the sinking, Captain Smith, uh, Thomas Andrews, and every millionaire you've ever heard of perishes with the ship. Captain Smith decides to go down with the ship. Uh, but J. Bruce Ismay uh, decides to get onto a lifeboat. And... Um, Unfortunately for him, that would be a decision um, that would basically ruin the rest of his life. Um, many refer to him as the biggest coward of all times. Um, so, you know, he's kind of our, our villain uh, in, in the Titanic story. So there he is. Um, there is a cartoon over here 
um, you know, the lost and everybody who's, you know, important. Um, and then there he is on the other side as being saved. So not a great decision. Um, I, I don't really know. Uh, you know, I've never been in this situation before. So, you know, do you take the chance once you've loaded everybody and everybody says, and anyone else, you know, do you get into the ship, uh, into that lifeboat uh, or not? Do you choose to die? Don't know. So obviously, uh, the closer you are to the lifeboats in first class, um, the, the better the chance of your survival. Uh, third class, um, they did go down to the wreck and see that some sections of third class were gated off and there were locked gates. Um, the crew, for the most part, the ones who did get off of the ship were there to row because um, not every first class lady knew how to row a lifeboat uh, or, or man a ship. So um, that's where a lot of those officers and uh, crew members uh, are, are able to get off the ship onto a lifeboat. So some stories of our, our survivors and our victims. Um, Edith Course Evans was a, a first class passenger who had uh, gone to a fortune teller recently and uh, she was telling some of her friends aboard Titanic about it. The fortune teller said to beware of water. And uh, when it came time to go up to uh, the lifeboats, uh, Edith, she, she hesitates and uh, waits for the, the next lifeboat uh, and does not go with her friends. Uh, she reportedly allowed her friend who had children to get into the lifeboat before her. But um, obviously the fortune teller had it, had it pretty good. She, she called it to you know, beware of water, but um, it did not end well for Edith. Uh, she perishes in the disaster. Uh, Eva Hart seen here with her mother and her father. Uh, they were traveling in second class. Uh, the hearts were supposed to be on a different ship, but because of that coal strike, uh, found themselves aboard the Titanic. And her father thought it was the, the greatest thing uh, to be on the most luxurious ship of all times. Uh, but the mother was very hesitant and uh, cautious uh, because she thought that calling something unsinkable was flying in the face of God. And she had a premonition, the only time in her life that she ever had one, uh, that something terrible was going to happen at night. So every single day while they were aboard Titanic, uh, she would sleep all day and stay up all night, uh, kind of waiting for this terrible something. And on April 14th, the, the terrible something of the iceberg uh, happens. Uh, they all go up to the boat deck and um, uh, Eva and her mother uh, make it off the ship. Um, the, the cool part um, is that Eva uh, is uh, outspoken. She, I mean, there are many, many interviews available on YouTube. Again, I will put some links uh, here below. Benjamin Guggenheim. So he was a, uh, a millionaire aboard Titanic, supposedly aboard with his mistress. Um, and uh, when he, uh, his steward came by to tell him to get up to the lifeboats, uh, the steward uh, handed him a life jacket and, and pushed him up there and uh, realized that he hadn't put this life jacket on. So the steward uh, you know, took him back to his cabin, uh, put on the life jacket, which is kind of eh, not comfortable. I mean, they're all made out of like these weird chunks of cork. You know, they're kind of restrictive, but it's meant to save your life, not be comfortable. Uh, he threw a sweater over top of that, uh, threw on a jacket and sent Mr. Guggenheim back up to the boat deck. So the steward continued to check on other people that he was uh, in charge of uh, and came back later to find that Mr. Guggenheim has uh, changed out of his life jacket and sweater, uh, has dressed in his tuxedo and top hat, uh, and uh, is kind of waiting on the boat deck. And he says, Mr. Guggenheim, what on earth are you doing? Uh, and he says, I have dressed in my finest and I'm prepared to go down as a gentleman. I'm not stupid. I can tell how many seats there are available on the lifeboats and women and children first. So uh, I've written this letter uh, to my wife. If you should survive, could you please uh, make sure sh that she gets that? So unfortunately, Mr. Guggenheim does perish in the disaster. Uh, again, not ever sure. Um, you know, knowing what your fate's going to be, could you change into your tuxedo and top hat and, uh, you know, dressed in your finest, prepare to meet the end. Margaret Brown was never called Molly during her lifetime. So the unsinkable Molly Brown is really a, a Hollywood musical creation. Um, she was referred to as Maggie. So Maggie Brown um, was an incredible woman. Uh, she and her husband struck it rich in Colorado. Um, and uh, she started a lot of social programs within her town, uh, especially when the, the mines that her husband owned had to close. Um, you know, she wanted to make sure that the, the 
townsfolk were, were taken care of. Um, she was traveling in Europe, um, having a, a lovely time. And uh, when she gets into the lifeboat, she is insistent um, that, you know, as there are people in the water, uh, that the boat actually go back for survivors. Now, unfortunately for her, in her lifeboat, the person in charge is Quartermaster Hitchens, the gentleman who was actually at the wheel when Titanic hit the iceberg. So you can imagine his mental state was pretty unstable at that point. Uh, very pessimistic view. And um, he actually does threaten uh, that if she doesn't shut up about it, uh, that he will throw her overboard. Um, so Maggie Brown, uh, you know, stops shouting to go back, but she does encourage the women to keep rowing, to keep them warm, uh, and try to lift their spirits um, throughout the whole the whole ordeal of the many hours they were out there waiting for a rescue ship. Um, she's also uh, incredible in that she uh, wanted to thank uh, the people who were involved in their rescue. And uh, the rescue ship, the Carpathia, uh, Captain Rostrin here, uh, she commissioned Congress to help pay for uh, a silver loving cup to thank the captain and uh, these titanic medals for each of the crew members who was aboard that rescue ship that night. So um, in the collection of the Maslin Museum, we have a Carpathia medal that was struck uh, for this uh, thank you from the Titanic survivors. Um, so the, the gentleman who uh, owned the medal uh, was uh, Edward Abbott, and he was a steward aboard uh, the ship uh, the night the Titanic sank. Um, so on the left there, uh, that is him in older age. On the right, that is actually his rugby team. Um, and they actually got together to raise funds for the Titanic survivors. Um, so that was fantastic. Um, one of the cool things uh, about this job is actually meeting people who are related or touch history. Um, so uh, this is um, Roy and Denise Darby. And uh, they visited... Uh, me and the artifacts um, in 2014, uh, which was so cool, um, you know, to be able to share those photographs and uh, the medal with them. So it is a very uh, small medal, um, but it has on one side, it's kind of like the beard of um, Poseidon, kind of um, making up a, a circle there. And uh, it is the ship, the Carpathia. And then on the back, and unfortunately back in, in the museum time uh, that this was donated in 1958, they write their accession numbers that identify an artifact in like big red numbers. So uh, apologies for that. But it is engraved to Edward Abbott uh, from the survivors of the SS Titanic. Um, so it does say, uh, presented to the captain, officers, and crew of the RMS Carpathia in recognition of gallant, heroic, services from the survivors of the SS Titanic, April 15th, 1912. Uh, Edward Abbott uh, being a steward aboard the Carpathia, how does that get to Massillon, Ohio? Uh, so uh, Abbott uh, actually came here in the 1920s to work at Republic Steel. Uh, and then he lived here until the end of his life in 1958 uh, when his estate then donated his artifacts here uh, to the museum. Uh, what is cool is that we do have, in addition to those photographs that you see there, uh, we also have several artifacts from the Carpathia as well. Uh, this is a list of the second class passengers who were aboard uh, the Carpathia when they were picked up. And this is a fabulous menu from August of 1912 from, uh, from the Carpathia and a beautiful color postcard of uh, the Carpathia itself. So again, these people who are very smart in thinking that someday somebody might want to see these things uh, and keeping, keeping them as a really good archivist. So one of the many, many sad stories uh, of this night is the Allison family. Uh, they were, uh, Bess and Hudson were traveling with their two uh, beautiful children and uh, Lorraine and baby Trevor. And um, there was a nurse also who was involved uh, in caring for baby Trevor because he was tiny. And um, when the, the call went to go up to the boat deck, um, the nurse uh, actually took baby Trevor without telling anyone, got into a lifeboat, and then <laughs> was sent off the ship. Um, so a, a distraught Bess Allison, of course, looking for her baby, 
um, not finding him. Um, and even when Hudson tried to, to get her to get into a lifeboat uh, and just trust that the baby was safe somewhere, um, still wouldn't do it. Um, and unfortunately, they spend the rest of the time uh, up until the, the sinking looking for poor baby Trevor. Um, so all three uh, of the, the Allisons that remained uh, on the ship perish, including uh, little, little Lorraine here. Um, so, you know, this nurse obviously thinking she's doing something good, saving the baby. Um, you can see how she's portrayed in the newspapers is kind of interesting. So this is the actual photo uh, of her with the baby. Uh, but then the newspapers altered it to make it look like she was super sinister, like she was stealing the baby or, you know, doing something bad. Um, regardless of what her intentions were, um, it was a very tragic, tragic moment as the, as the family uh, perishes as a result of her actions. Uh, so uh, Michelle and Edmund Navratil uh, were with their father, Michelle Sr., uh, Michelle and uh, their mother were unfortunately having uh, kind of a separation. They were kind of moving towards divorce. Um, so the children were with their, their mom uh, in France, and uh, Michelle picked them up to spend his time with them. Uh, but instead of just taking them home, he takes them aboard the Titanic. And um, uh, as they uh, go up to the boat deck, uh, Michelle realizes that he can't get into the boat because uh, he's not a woman or a child. And um, you know, he's kind of put his babies in danger. And uh, so he sets uh, both of them into a lifeboat, luckily. And uh, he says, when your mother comes to gather you, uh, you know, please let her know that I wanted her to follow us to America to start a new life uh, for us to be happy and reunited. Um, and please tell her that I'm sorry. Um, so unfortunately, Michelle Sr. Uh, passes, uh, passes away in the disaster. Um, but uh, little, little Michelle and uh, Edmund are, are saved. Uh, what makes this such an interesting story is that uh, these poor kids, they only speak French and, um, you know, they can't really identify themselves per se. They know their first names, uh, but they can't really tell, you know, where their dad is or where their mom lives. So um, they take this picture in the center uh, and they start circulating it in magazines and newspapers across the, the globe uh, to see, you know, whose children are these. So uh, luckily the mother in France does uh, find this picture and uh, contacts the White Star Line to get her children back. And um, the, the uh, White Star was very kind in paying for her passage to come get the children and then take them home again. Um, so uh, she is reunited uh, with, with her babies. So the Nabertil boys. Uh, Isidore Strauss came from Bavaria when he was a child. Uh, he actually ended up uh, being a Confederate Army uh, blockade runner uh, during the American Civil War. Uh, he and his brother Nathan eventually uh, invest in and found uh, Macy's department store. And uh, he and his wife uh, get the chance to travel quite often. Ida wasn't feeling very well, so they were out on the Riviera taking a vacation. So when the call goes to go up to the boat deck, um, the, the Strausses uh, get up to a boat pretty easily as, as first class passengers, and uh, Ida gets into the boat, and uh, Isidore steps back. And the gentleman in charge of loading the boat says, uh, you know, Mr. Strauss, I don't think that anyone would object to a man of your age getting into a lifeboat. And he looks around and he says, not before the younger men. Ida, uh, of course, not being stupid, knows that there really is not going to be another boat for Isidore. So she gets out of the lifeboat. And he, uh, Isidore says, what are you doing? And she says, uh, I've spent my entire life with you, and uh, where you go, I go. And uh, the two of them are uh, seen uh, on the boat deck, uh, basically holding each other until the end, uh, Ida choosing to die with her husband as opposed to go on without him. So towards the end, uh, as, as the lifeboats are being launched, um, many people recall hearing the band play on deck to keep people calm. Um, there is an argument as to whether or not um, there was a song playing at the very end, what that last song was. Some say it was Autumn, which is kind of a jazz tune. There's also Song uh, of Autumn, which I think is a hymn, uh, We're Nearer My God to Thee. Um, and having researched a little bit about Wallace Hartley, um, you know, he was a 33-year-old and uh, he told uh, a newspaper and his friends uh, many years previous that if he should find himself 
at a shipwreck, um, you know, knowing he's going to go down with the ship, what would he like to play? And he said, near my God to thee, uh, kind of as his own uh, funeral. Um, all of the band members uh, perish in the disaster. Um, Wallace Hartley's violin uh, was a beautiful gift from his fiance, uh, Maria, and uh, was recently discovered um, in an attic uh, a few years ago. And uh, through much testing and confirmation, they uh, did, in fact, confirm that this is Wallace Hartley's violin. Uh, it was in a case that he was able to strap to his body. Um, uh, and uh, when his body was picked up uh, after the disaster, the violin was the thing that they were able to give his fiance uh, as his belongings. Um, she apparently had put it in the attic and never really wanted to speak about it again. So the timeline of the sinking, we are, are nearing the end, uh, you know, as all 2,208 stories uh, of each one of these people, um, you know, is taking place simultaneously. Uh, some getting off of the boat and some not getting off of the boat. At 2.10, the last wireless distress signal was, was given uh, before the, the power goes out, and uh, Harold Bride pulls Jack Phillips away from the key uh, to go and try to find some sort of salvation. Uh, at 2.18, the lights go out, uh, and the forward funnel uh, collapses, killing those in the water. At 2.19, uh, the Titanic breaks in two between the third and fourth funnels. And the only reason that we know this is because they found the wreck. Otherwise, we would not have known necessarily that all of this uh, occurred. Um, so as Titanic, this is the best illustration piece ever. Uh, so as the Titanic has, has pulled down with all of this water, um, you know, the stress of being up in the air like that is way too great. Um, so she does, in fact, I'm going to unhook it. There we go. Uh, it does, in fact, break in half. Um, so as the, the front part uh, finally pulls away, the reason it took a while was because there was that double hull that, again, was supposed to make her super strong and last longer uh, if she should hit something. Um, kind of dangles off there, and uh, the front half uh, planes towards the ocean floor. Uh, this back half, um, now uh, Cameron has kind of changed his mind as to what exactly this would have looked like. So instead of like in the Titanic movie by James Cameron, not necessarily a straight up sinking, um, but a kind of a more angled sinking. So as it kind of hits the water, it kind of creates a bubble. So it's kind of got to like blow that air out somewhere so that it can finally uh, go down and sink. Uh, and it went very, very fast. Um, so... Uh, the suction of the water, you know, pulls some of the people under, pulls, um, you know, pulls a lot of the lifeboats nearby. That's why they've rowed so far away from the boat uh, to make sure that the suction doesn't get them. So the, uh, the bow section uh, traveling at 34 miles per hour towards the ocean floor uh, finally hits and uh, is kind of in one direction. The back half with this little dangly uh, you know, double hull there kind of spirals down and spins many different ways. And that's what kind of all the contents of her, uh, you know, spilling out uh, what make up the debris field. And so at this point, because she's flipped and flopped and moved around so many times, um, she is a hot mess here, uh, uh, almost a mile away from the, the other section, and she is backwards. Um, so today, it kind of looks like if you took wet cardboard and you threw it into a pile. Um, it's not very recognizable, uh, and so much stuff is just kind of flopped over each other. Obviously, we know in the wreck um, today, you know, the most uh, iconic thing uh, is to see the bow of the ship coming out of the darkness, um, you know, as, as a submersible approaches it. So there you have it. Uh, so this is one of the renderings of what she looks like on the ocean floor, um, you know, as she hit the ocean floor, too, don't forget that she's kind of like pulled a lot of air uh, and water down with her as she fell. So there's kind of like a explosion y downdraft. So the Carpathia. So the good news is for the 705 survivors um, who are in the lifeboats, um, you know, kind of waiting for the, the screams for help from the 1,500 people in the water. Um, the good news is, is that there is someone coming to save them. Because um, for a while they didn't know, but Harold Bride uh, informed them that, yes, the, the Carpathia was in fact coming. Uh, so by 1235, uh, Captain Rostrin uh, starts to turn around. They were on their way to the Mediterranean, so he turns around to go uh, and pick up survivors of the Titanic. So they arrive on scene at 3.30 in the morning. Um, 
Titanic goes underwater at 2.20, so you know, a full hour after he arrives on scene, but uh, there's so much ice, it takes a long time for him to go around all of these ice fields, icebergs, um, to actually find uh, survivors and lifeboats uh, around. So um, finally by 4.10, the very first lifeboat uh, is brought aboard Carpathia, and then it takes them a full four hours to load all, uh, all of the boats uh, up to the ship. So the unfortunate part is that there were a couple lifeboats uh, that kind of drifted too far away and they wouldn't actually be found for another month. Um, so there were a few survivors in a lifeboat that did, um, did kind of catch a current and n did not get found until they, they had died of uh, exposure. So, uh, so Carpathia, um, they uh, hold, a hold a small prayer service and uh, start heading towards New York. Uh, the interesting thing is that the passengers aboard the Carpathia had cameras. So there are actual pictures of uh, survivors in the Titanic lifeboats approaching, uh, approaching the ship. So this is one of those collapsible boats that I talked about. There were four of them. Um, they've got these kind of canvas sides that pop up um, and that you know, make them storable on top of the officer's quarters. But this is, uh, this is one of the collapsible boats. And there was one uh, overturned uh, lifeboat that uh, about 28 uh, survivors were on top of all night. Um, this included uh, Second Officer Lightoller, Harold Bride, and Jack Phillips. Uh, again, Jack Phillips died of exposure uh, overnight, but Harold Bride survived. He was on the edge of this with his feet in the water the whole time. Uh, and this is an ice field, not necessarily the iceberg or the ice field, but this is an ice field of the time. So then we get to the mystery ship Californian. So as the Californian wakes up, she starts to hear the wireless traffic again and realizes that nearby uh, Titanic uh, has foundered overnight and 1,500 people have died. Um, so they, they realize they probably could have done something. So they, they offer their assistance, but Rostrin and the Carpathia say, no, thank you, we've, we've got it. Um, What's so interesting is there's still a debate today as to how far away the Californian uh, actually was to Titanic. Um, many officers uh, on deck and many survivors in the lifeboats um, talk about seeing some lights on the horizon that were getting closer. They thought there was a ship coming to save them and that, you know, could save everybody on board. Um, supposedly was the Californian. Um, you know, how close she was, uh, many said within five miles, some within nine miles, but of course the Californian captain uh, said it must have been, you know, at least 19 or 20 miles away because then it wouldn't sound so bad. So we're not sure how close she was. She was close enough to, to make a difference though, is the point. So uh, as Titanic steams towards New York, um, they have shut down the wireless to only transmit the names of those who uh, are, are survivors aboard the ship. Um, they're not going to give any details as to how Titanic sank. Um, this gave the newspapers a lot of time uh, to be able to kind of speculate and say whatever they wanted um, for, for several days while the Carpathia made its way towards New York. So interestingly for Maslin, um, again, you know, the ship sank at 2.20 in the, in the morning. So unless you had a super speedy turnaround time for the newspaper, like you wouldn't have known uh, that the ship sank. Um, so if your newspaper deadline was like midnight, then you'd know that like map, it, it struck an iceberg, but everything's probably okay because it's unsinkable, right? So most of them say, you know, Titanic crew and passengers safe. Uh, giant liner is still afloat, badly damaged uh, because it hit an iceberg, but, uh, you know, we'll keep you informed if anything should change. Um, some of them say, you know, all were saved. They're being towed to Halifax for uh, repairs. Um, and then again, kind of as these numbers and no official really good, like, passenger list existed, um, you know, your numbers up here can vary um, incredibly widely uh, depending on what, what newspaper and when it was published. Um, obviously, the, the further along in time we get, the more information we have and the more accurate our facts can be. So uh, when they arrive in New York uh, on April 18th, uh, the Carpathia pulls up to uh, White Star Lines Pier uh, 54. Um, 
so again, there, you know, there's this massive crowd that's gathered that they want to, um, you know, they want to see these Titanic survivors. They want to see if their loved ones are on board. Um, you know, a massive crowd awaiting this, this historic moment. Um, keeping in mind, of course, then that the millionaires um, were incredibly well taken care of. Um, yes, they had just lost their husbands, but Mrs. Astor, who was pregnant, um, she was met by two cars, two doctors, a nurse, a secretary, and her stepson. So she had a big circle of support there. Um, Mrs. George Widener was met by her own special train, including her own private Pullman car. Um, Mrs. Charles Hayes was met by a special train with two private cars and coaches. So like they're traveling in luxury. Um, any of these third class uh, survivors would have had nothing. Um, you know, for the most part, again, kind of starting this new life in America, they brought everything with them. So whatever just went down with the ship, whatever they're carrying is what they have now. Um, so uh, this is where uh, Margaret Brown uh, really comes in handy. She spoke several languages and she was able to help a lot of these uh, people find where they needed to go uh, and get funds um, to, to help them. Uh, this is where the Titanic Survivors Fund uh, fundraisers uh, really help uh, a lot of those uh, you know, unfortunate souls who literally lost everything. Uh, so a group got together um, for the uh, Illustrated London News um, not long after Titanic just to show uh, what exactly it meant um, to lose uh, 1,500 people. And this is 1,500 people. So after the ship sank, uh, insurance claims uh, were, uh, were starting to be filed. They were still paying claims into 1915 and probably after that as well, of course, you know, fighting to not have to pay everything. Um, you could uh, get a payout of about $10,000 for a person who was lost. Uh, one woman actually forgot to list her husband in the list of things that she lost, which was I thought was kind of silly. Um, and uh, you could be reimbursed for items if you provided a list. Uh, and this is where uh, archivists and the 21st century come in uh, to play because through the National Archives, you can actually see many of these insurance claims. So some of the really, really cool ones, we've got Margaret Brown. She has kind of a, a one pager. And uh, I have cut off, of course, the, the total, but she has quite a quite a list of things. And then we have William Carter with the car, which is listed on here for $5,000. And uh, his total is $11,000. Again, look these up online. It's very cool to see what people remember. Like he has five dozen shirts. Like who remembers how many dozen shirts they had in their trunk? I don't know. So my favorite, favorite, favorite is the wonderful Charlotte Cardiza. Now, she had a total of one hundred and seventy seven thousand dollars and it is a 19 page list of every single thing that she owned i don't know if she just had an amazing memory or if she had like some sort of backup inventory of like stuff that she brought with her um, i mean she has it down to uh which uh, dress was trimmed how um exactly where uh she bought uh, certain things. So like in her Louis Vuitton uh, tray trunk, she had a pink evening uh, coat trimmed with silver, Irish lace, and, uh, purchased at Redfern Paris for $380. So like she was down to the detail as to exactly where she acquired all of these things, um, who designed them, in what trunk. Um, incredible. So again, please check these out. Um, you know, archives are online for your enjoyment and research. So ta-da. So besides the fact that there was no moon, no wind, we didn't have binoculars to see the iceberg, uh, we turned the ship too slowly and punctured uh, six uh, spots along the uh, watertight bulkheads. Besides the fact that we didn't have enough lifeboats for everybody, why did the Titanic actually sink and, and have such a, a loss of life? Well, of course, there's a lot of great conspiracy theories. Uh, such as she was never christened. Uh, Titanic was not christened and that was uh, a white star line thing that they just didn't happen to christen their ships. So I'm not sure what part that played in the whole, uh, the whole sinking, but here we are. Uh, some claim that there was a, a curse of an Egyptian mummy. Uh, this mummy was being transported. It was a very unlucky mummy, um, supposedly was from the British Museum and then whisked away aboard the Titanic and then that caused the ship to sink. 
Um, the uh, lid of that mummy is in the British Museum, but they don't actually have a record of that mummy ever existing. So, boo, who knows? Um, some claim uh, that because uh, the ship was built in Ireland, there was a, a Protestant versus Catholic um, conflict, we'll call it. And um, supposedly the number of Titanic, if you wrote it backwards, uh, said no pope. So it must have been an anti-Catholic conspiracy to sink this ship. I'm not really sure. Um, Titanic's number was actually 401 uh, and not whatever that is. Um, you know, and I'm not sure how that would have brought the ship down. So, you know, here we are. Conspiracy theories. Uh, some say it's the ghosts of the workers that were buried in the walls that, that uh, were killed during the building of the ship. Um, there was no one buried in the walls. There were some workers, unfortunately, who fell uh, from upper scaffolding while the ship was being built. Um, but I don't know what part that would play in the sinking. Um, there is an amazing conspiracy theory that um, the Olympic, uh, just before Titanic launched, having hit the SS Hawk, uh, you know, kind of stabbed into the ship. There were so much repairs to the Olympic, and it was already, you know, an older ship, you know, by a couple years. So could we just switch the nameplates on Olympic and Titanic? And then we can just, like, sink the Olympic, cash in on the insurance money, and no one would be the wiser. Of course, you have to like kill 1,500 people to get to that point. Um, and yes, the Olympic and the Titanic were so very similar in look, but I don't think you could get away with all of those things. Um, some people have debunked this myth, um, especially w at the wreck of the Titanic, looking on um, the propellers to see that yes, 401 Titanic's you know build number uh, was in fact written in on some of the pieces in the parts. So. Um, a cool and interesting thought, um, but Olympic and Titanic, I don't believe, were switched uh, to, to claim the insurance money. Uh, some claim that J.P. Morgan, uh, who had an interest in the ship and was actually booked on the ship and then just um, you know, canceled at the last minute, was trying to kill off his millionaire rivals who uh, were against some of his banking policies. Um, so, you know, Strauss and, and Astor, if they went down with the ship, that would be kind of advantageous. Um, I, S again, kind of seems like an overkill that you would kill that many people to get this one thing out of your way, but uh, I'm not sure. So this one kind of requires a little bit more reading on my part, um, but some very interesting <laughs> thoughts as to why she sank. Uh, again, I, I don't know who, like, did J.P. Morgan call up then the iceberg to say, like, hey, could you take down the ship? That'd be great. I, mm, I'm not sure how all the working pieces and parts of this uh, would really happen. Um, in 1898, uh, Morgan Robertson uh, wrote a book uh, called The Futility or the Wreck of the Titan. Now, what is so cool uh, about this is that 14 years before Titanic sank, he writes a story about a ship that is 800 feet long that leaves from New York uh, on an April morning, hits an iceberg in the North Atlantic, and sinks. Ha uh ha, -huh, starting to sound familiar here. Um, the uh, they had the same uh, almost the same number of passengers and lifeboats and options. Um, the comparisons are are incredibly close. Um, so there's a table here. Um, again, I will I will post some links to some things here if you want to read more about this. Um, but it you know basically he he called it. It was um, you know man's over confidence that they'd beaten the ocean and uh, here we are in the North Atlantic uh, and, and we're dying. So uh, in Robertson's uh, book, only 13 people survived. So at least it wasn't as tragic as, as, his, uh, as his story said. So, so uh, many fundraisers uh, were held um, to help uh, those who, who had survived. Again, um, Edward Abbott and his uh, uh, rugby team getting together to raise funds, um, and also, of course, memorializing those uh, who perished. So um, this is the uh, Isidore and Ida Strauss Memorial in New York City, um, and that is the uh, memorial in Washington, D.C. There were uh, plenty of songs written about the disaster. Uh, I do want to pull this one out because it is part of our uh, collection. It is kind of shiny, so I'm going to try and, and get it at a, a point there. Uh, is The Sinking of the Titanic by M. O. Roosh. Uh, and he was from Canton. He was a piano teacher. Um, it's part Nearer My God to Thee and, um, you know, part song. It you know, sounds very much like a song from the day. So, um, memorialized there in 1912. 
So obviously, after a tragedy of this magnitude, um, you want to make sure to find out why it happened and how to prevent it from happening again. So the British uh, and the Americans uh, held inquiries. Um, the American inquiry started uh, immediately upon arrival in New York. Uh, they gathered everyone together so they couldn't, you know, change their story or, you know, wander off. But the, the kind of major players uh, were held there. So um, both were published and both of them basically said there were so many things that went wrong. Um, you know, it's no one, no one particular person's fault, but there, you know, here's a whole bunch of stuff uh, that happened that was, that was bad that led to this disaster. The uh, International Ice Patrol was formed in 1913 to uh, to make sure that uh, they knew where every iceberg was. Um, and you can actually go on their website still today uh, to see where icebergs are in the North Atlantic. So if you're if you interested, that uh, that is an option. Um, the 24-hour radio operator uh, had to be on, uh, you know, and switch shifts uh, for warnings and emergencies, not just passenger traffic. Um, you know, again, that would have been helpful if Cyril Evans on the Californian had uh, a backup who was... Uh, listening in 24 hours a day so and of course the the number one thing uh -huh, uh you have to carry enough lifeboats for everyone on board the ship Ta-da! and you have to hold that lifeboat drill within 24 hours of being at sea um so that everybody knows where they're supposed to go when they're supposed to go there um what's so interesting is that you know you would think that in more than 100 years we might have learned something about sinking ships um, but in 2012, the Costa Concordia um, hadn't even been, uh, you know, <laughs> sailing for 24 hours. They hadn't even held their lifeboat drill yet. And, um, you know, she ran aground and she sank and, and started to, to turn over. And many people died on that ship 100 years after Titanic. So, um, you know, nothing is perfect. And um, what I thought was so interesting is that there was so much cell phone video uh, of the Costa Concordia going um, you know, sinking and uh, the confusion of getting to the lifeboats. And I felt like that had to have been <laughs> what it was like aboard Titanic, except now we have cell phones and we could record this, um, the, these weird moments. So um, just kind of interesting to look at the, the two of those 100 years apart um, and know that, again, we haven't really conquered nature. Surprise. Um, so there have been many times uh, throughout history that... Uh, Titanic has really kind of come to the forefront of popular culture and people being excited and interested in it. Um, the uh, 1955 Walter Lord Night to Remember, uh, he actually interviewed 60 survivors um, in order to write his book and his is uh, considered to be the most accurate. Because um, if you think about it, the closer you are to the time period of the event you're writing about and the more firsthand accounts that you can actually gather together, um, you know, that's going to be the more accurate than, you know, say me trying to write something, you know, I don't have the access to those survivors anymore. Um, so that would be the most accurate. In 1958, it was turned into a film. Um, and what was interesting is that some of the survivors thought that they could, you know, it's been 40 some years, we can totally go see this Titanic movie that depicts that horrible night in our lives. And, um, Unfortunately, some of the, the girls that went had lost their fathers aboard Titanic, and uh, so they went to, you know, see A Night to Remember, and they said, never again shall we watch uh, a Titanic movie, because um, it was just too gut-wrenching and real, and uh, reminded them uh, of that night. Um, so that's really where the, the kind of interest kicks back off, um, to uh, remind people that... Uh, uh, remind people that that Titanic was um, an incredible story that still needed to be to be told. Um, in 1985, uh, the interest was renewed again when uh, you know for decades they had been trying to find Titanic. Um, you know, you have the coordinates of where they sent the CQD and the SOS, um, but you know as the ship kind of split apart, where is it? Um, there was an earthquake uh, off the coast of Canada that could have possibly. Um, you know, slid over and buried the Titanic wreckage. So they weren't really sure where exactly uh, it was. Um, so they really wanted to find it, uh, you know, before it disappeared. So um, in 1985, Robert Ballard was the one who finally uh, dragged a camera uh, across the ocean floor and saw uh, the image of a boiler. And uh, we'll see that here in a second. 
So, oh, now we found the Titanic. Now we know and we can see and confirm for sure that she split in half, um, which was something that was a question for all that time. Um, and uh, so that was definitely a, b a big, big moment. Uh, I come on board here in 1997 with James Cameron's Titanic, uh, which I believe I saw in the theaters four times that first round when it was in theaters. It came back to theaters. It came out in 3D. I, I've gone every time. Uh, it's come out with a new thing. Um, just such an interesting way to get people involved into the story. Fictional, yes, but still uh, enough accuracy and adventure to um, you know hold your interest. Uh, at the same time in 1997, which I think is cool, uh, Titanic the New Musical came out. And uh, it was on Broadway for a while. And uh, I'm very happy to say that I was able to uh, to act in that musical with uh, Voices of Canton with my dad, uh, which was a, a very cool moment. So it was some really good music, um, so many characters and so many bits of accurate information, but, you know, with a song, uh, you know, to kind of to kind of drive it home, which is really great. Um, in uh, 2012, with the 100th anniversary of the singing, that's uh, definitely another big key time when people, uh, you know, remember and start to research and start to get excited. Um, and that was what brought out this presentation uh, eight years ago, uh, was, was getting involved in a lot of 100th anniversary moments. Um, so here I am eight years later still talking about it and uh, will continue to do so uh, until there are no more people who want to hear it. So. So finding the Titanic. So in September of 1985, again, uh, Robert Ballard uh, found uh, that part of uh, one of the boilers on the ocean floor, and they realized that that had to be Titanic. So uh, many, many uh, dives down. Um, unfortunately, uh, because he found the wreck, he could have in that moment actually claimed the wreck and never let anybody touch it for the rest of forever. Uh, instead, he was appealing to the better part of mankind, and he put a plaque that said, please respect this wreck, um, you know, just hoping that people wouldn't come down and, and start salvaging and, and tearing it apart. Um, so because he didn't claim it in that moment, um, that kind of left it up and open for people to start claiming it. Uh, so there are there were more than 705 different insurance claims as to who owns the wreck, uh, and RMS Titanic Incorporated became... Uh, the solver uh, in possessor. So they are the ones who do the artifacts exhibit and they have the rights to the wreck. So on the wreck, um, the thing to note is that, you know, softer things like wood and bone, um, paper are all pretty well gone. Um, they would have been eroded away or eaten by small uh, critters on the ocean floor. Um, Typically, when things are salvaged that are paper, uh, means that they were in a suitcase that was, you know, protected by leather, um, you know, coated in something. So there are those moments where they do find these kinds of things on the ocean floor. Um, currently, the uh, ship is being eaten uh, by a bacteria that just loves metal. Um, so that is where the the little critters are eating uh, the ship and then spitting back out what are these like rusticles, where it kind of looks like the ship is melting, uh, if you will. So uh, as salvagers kind of go down to the ocean floor and you accidentally, in your you know little rover, you bump a, a wall, well, you're bumping this very delicate thing. Um, so we're starting to see the, the results of that damage and the, the kind of touching of the wreck uh, come to fruition as they start to see the, the ship split apart. And uh, they really believe that like within the next 10 to 20 years, uh, the wreck will just kind of collapse. Um, interestingly, I uh, just read an article from uh, January of 2020 uh, where they said that RMS Titanic Incorporated wants to go down and get the wireless room. So kind of one of the iconic things from Titanic being sending out CQDs and SOSs, they want to actually like cut a hole into the Titanic wreck to get uh, that that machinery before the wreck just kind of collapses in itself. So this is kind of like one of those like, how far is too far? Is it fine? Do we want to salvage that? Is that important for us all to talk about? Um, but they're actually going to go and cut through the wreck to, to obtain the thing that they want. So interesting. So uh, in 2012, for the 100th anniversary, they released pictures from 
um, that they had taken huge, huge high-res images, um, and they all got stitched, stitched together, and uh, they formed this beautiful uh, map of the, the wreck. So it was published in National Geographic, um, and uh, you can go to their website and actually like zoom into the, the pictures and see um, see the wreck up close if you want. And especially the debris field, it's always like a, you know, it's a huge swath of empty ocean, but then there's just these little bits and pieces of things that have fallen in the middle. And so as I said, um, the, uh, <laughs> the, the back end of Titanic, again, kind of just looks like a weird pile of wet cardboard. Um, but they've got high-res pictures, and again, you can kind of zoom into these uh, on uh, RMS Titanic Incorporated, uh, lots of great high-res pictures. Um, so again, so the rights of the Titanic, um, you know, is it grave robbing for us to go down there? Uh, is it just that maybe not enough time has passed? Because um, when we think of people visiting King Tut's tomb uh, and, and bringing back artifacts, no one really quite raises a stink about that because nobody knew him. We're, we're far enough away. Uh, it's more of an archaeological dig, whereas this is a little bit closer. Um, so, you know, some debates to have um, as to whether or not we should just leave the wreck alone because it is the grave site for 1,500 people. Um, or do we need to bring these artifacts back for us to discuss it, to never forget, uh, you know, it could go either way. It's definitely a discussion to, to talk about. Uh, the Titanic Historical Society um, displays artifacts that were uh, given to them by survivors. So they, they are very proud of that, that they don't have anything that was, was salvaged. So two different, two different thoughts, throwing that out there. You can easily uh, get yourself a piece of Titanic for $61,000. Uh, life jackets uh, go for about that much. Uh, you can visit the wreck for about $105,000. Uh, two hour descent down, spend about four to six hours down there on the, on the wreck itself, and then a two hour climb back up in the darkness. Uh, as a uh, person who is claustrophobic, I don't think I could make that happen. Uh, a couple did get married there uh, on the bow of the Titanic. Uh, again, at best moment, at the, the kind of end of the Edwardian era, why are we still so intrigued? Um, you know, it's just such an intriguing story with so many moving pieces and parts. Um, you know, such a romantic thing. There's heroism. There's, there's, uh, there's bad things. There's mean people. There's a villain. It's such an intriguing story. Um, so uh, I highly encourage you all to dig deeper, take a look, uh, research to your heart's content, uh, especially visit Encyclopedia Titanica. That is the resource. They've been on this since 1996, and uh, they just continue to do a stellar, stellar job uh, digging in and adding content all the time. So please leave your questions below, and uh, I look forward to chatting with you all online.